Stand on the Bonneville Flats today and you're surrounded by 30,000 acres of brilliant white nothingness. But 18,000 years ago, if you stood at the same spot, you'd be under 300 meters of water because you'd be in the middle of a freshwater lake larger than modern Lake Michigan. A lake so vast, it stretched from central Utah into Nevada and Idaho. So in today's video, we discuss the story of how that lake formed and how its legacy defines Utah and the Great Basin to this day. And as always, this is Ali and welcome back to Urban Atlas. So now let's head back to approximately 30,000 years. We're at the height of the last glacial maximum, and there's massive ice sheets burying Canada and the northern United States. The American Southwest was experiencing something very different. It was getting wetter. You see, this ice age brought cooler temperatures and increased precipitation to what we now call the Great Basin. This geographic region between the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada had no outlets to the ocean. It was a closed basin, meaning water flowed in but couldn't flow out except through evaporation. And during this time, as the rainfall increased in this region, water started to accumulate at the lowest point of the Great Basin. Rivers carried rainfall from surrounding highlands. And critically, evaporation rates plummeted in the cooler climate. Water accumulated faster than it could evaporate. The result was this lake, and it was known as Lake Bonneville. At its maximum extent, its derised at Lake Bonneville covered approximately 52,000 square kilometers, or about 20,000 square miles. That's nearly as large as modern-day Lake Michigan. It's estimated that the lake stretched approximately 500 kilometers long and 200 kilometers wide. In its deepest point, the water would have reached 300 meters or about 1,000 feet deep. If this giant existed today, it would cover most of northwestern Utah and parts of eastern Nevada, as well as southern Idaho. Salt Lake City would be underwater. So would Provo, Ogden, and dozens of other communities. The Wasatch Mountains would be islands. And the landscape would have been unrecognizable in other ways too. The shores of Lake Bonneville were home to Ice Age megafauna we can barely imagine today. Jefferson's ground slots, three meter long and 900 kilogram herbivores with enormous claws would have been found near the water. Meanwhile, Western camels grazed the lakeside grasslands. Muskox, now restricted to the Arctic, thrived in Utah's cold, wet climate. Mastodons and woolly mammoths roamed nearby. As the lake level rose and fell with climate fluctuation, it carved distinct shorelines into the surrounding mountains. And these shorelines are visible today as horizontal lines on hillsides. They mark stable lake levels where waves cut terraces into bedrock for centuries or millennia. Three major shorelines are named. The Stansbury, formed around 25,000 years ago, the Bonneville, as well as the Provo, which we'll return to shortly. As Lake Bonneville rose towards its maximum extent, it reached a critical threshold. Near present-day Red Rock Pass in southeastern Idaho, the lake encountered the lowest point on the rim of the Great Basin, a natural barrier separating the closed Bonneville Basin from the Snake River drainage to the north. Now this barrier wasn't solid bedrock, it was an alluvial fan dam, which is basically a pile of gravel, sand, and sediment deposited over millennia by streams flowing down from the Bannock and Portnoff mountain ranges. Now this sediment had created a saddle-shaped dam that happened to be the lowest point on the basin's rim. Now, around 17,000 years ago, Lake Bonneville rose to an elevation of approximately 1,500 meters and began trickling over the top of this unconsolidated dam. For perhaps a thousand years, the overflow was stable and non-catastrophic, just enough water spilling north to maintain equilibrium. But then, around 14,000 years ago, everything changed. The exact trigger remains debated. Some geologists believe subsurface water began piping through the porous alluvial material, creating underground channels that weaken the dam structure, while others point to a 2020 hypothesis suggesting a massive earthquake generated a tsunami over 40 meters high that surged against the dam. Whatever the cause, the result was catastrophic. The alluvial dam had failed, and when it failed, it failed spectacularly. 
the breach rapidly eroded through the alluvial sediments and into underlying bedrock, water that had been held back for millennia suddenly found an escape route. It's estimated that at peak discharge, almost 1 million cubic meters per second poured through the breach. Flood is estimated to have lasted for weeks, possibly months. In total, the Bonneville flood drained approximately 4,750 cubic kilometers of water. The lake level dropped 107 meters. The floodwaters then swept into the Snake River Plain, where it scoured the landscape down to bedrock in places, creating channeled scablands similar to those in eastern Washington. The existing Snake River Canyon was dramatically deepened, in some places by over 150 meters. Eventually, the Bonneville floodwaters followed the Snake River Canyon all the way to the Columbia River in Oregon, eventually reaching the Pacific Ocean. Now, some scientists theorize that the Bonneville floodwaters actually merged with another glacial lake, that being Lake Missoula. After this catastrophic drainage, Lake Bonneville established a new level, the Provo shoreline, at an elevation of 1,400 meters. And for roughly 1,000 years, the lake maintained this level as a stable overflow lake. Water continued flowing out through the Red Rock Pass into the Snake River system, but now at a sustainable, non-catastrophic rate. The Provo shoreline became the most prominent and well-developed of Lake Bonneville's shorelines. Now, interestingly, during this stable period, a thick accumulation of tufa, a type of limestone formed by microbial action and mineral precipitation, built up along the shoreline. Now, these structures were created by colonies of cyanobacteria, and these are still visible today. They mark where the ancient waterline stood for centuries. But around 16,000 to 13,000 years ago, the climate began to change again. Slowly, temperatures began to rise and precipitation decreased. Most importantly, evaporation rates increased as the region warmed and dried. The water balance shifted negative. More water was evaporating from the lake surface than was entering from rivers and precipitation. The overflow at Red Rock Pass slowed to a trickle, and eventually it stopped entirely as the lake's depth continued to drastically drop. And just like that, Lake Bonneville had become a closed basin lake again, but now in a warming, drying climate. Now, what happened next was astonishingly rapid in geological terms. In approximately 2,000 years, the blink of an eye really in geology, Lake Bonneville shrank from a vast inland sea to something approaching the modern Great Salt Lake we have today. Throughout its history, Lake Bonneville had been relatively fresh water fed by rivers and glacial melt. But like all water, it contained dissolved minerals and salts that leached from surrounding rocks and soil. As the lake shrank, these salts became increasingly concentrated in the remaining water. By about 10,000 years ago, Lake Bonneville had fragmented into multiple smaller lakes occupying the lowest parts of the basin. The largest became the Great Salt Lake. Others were smaller lakes like Utah Lake. Today's Great Salt Lake occupies only about 4,400 square kilometers at average levels, less than 10% of Lake Bonneville's maximum extent. It's a shallow lake, one of the saltiest bodies of water on Earth. About 2 million tons of dissolved salt continue to be deposited in the lake every year by inflowing rivers, with nowhere to go except accumulating as the water continues to evaporate. So what did Lake Bonneville leave behind, and how does this ancient lake shape life in Utah today? Well, first and most obviously, the geography itself. The Salt Lake Valley and Utah Valley, these are flat, expansive valley floors that are actually ancient lake beds. The sediments deposited by Lake Bonneville created level surfaces perfect for urban development, agriculture, and transportation corridors. And through one of those valleys lies Interstate 15. It runs straight through the heart of an old lake bed. So does Interstate 80, Salt Lake City, Provo, Ogden, and Utah's major metropolitan centers all sit on sediments deposited by Lake Bonneville. The lake literally created the foundation for modern Utah civilization. In addition, the lake's sediment provides massive deposits of sand and gravel used for construction materials. The fine-grained sediments in former lake beds also create rich agricultural soils in many areas. Combined with modern irrigation from reservoirs and nearby mountains, these ancient lake beds support productive farmland. But as most of you probably know, 
Lake Bonneville's most famous legacy is the Bonneville Salt Flats. 30,000 acres of brilliant white salt crust west of the Great Salt Lake. As Lake Bonneville evaporated, it left behind approximately 147 million tons of salt. The salt concentrated in the lowest areas, creating deposits up to 1.5 meters thick in places. The perfect flatness of these salt flats make them ideal for land speed racing. The 300, 400, 500, and 600 miles per hour land speed barriers were all broken on the Bonneville salt flats. Numerous world records in various vehicle categories have been set here, and racing events continue to this day. The Great Salt Lake itself, North America's largest saltwater lake west of the Mississippi, is Lake Bonneville's direct descendant. Its unique chemistry, extreme salinity, and seasonal fluctuations all trace back to its Ice Age origins. And like many saline lakes around the world, this lake supports a massive brine shrimp industry. These tiny crustaceans thrive in these hypersaline waters and are harvested for use in aquaculture worldwide. But unfortunately, the Great Salt Lake faces its own crisis. Water diversions for agriculture and urban use, combined with drought and a warming climate, have shrunk the lake to historic lows. Exposed lake beds release dust storms. The ecosystem is threatened here, and the remaining salt concentration keeps increasing. And thus, the modern lake is disappearing through many of the same mechanisms that ended its Ice Age ancestor. Except now, human activity accelerates this process. Lake Bonneville also appears in the cultural memory of this region. Indigenous people have inhabited the Great Basin for over 13,000 years, meaning they witnessed Lake Bonneville's final stages and its transformation into the Great Salt Lake. Archaeological evidence and oral traditions suggest deep knowledge of the changing landscape. And thus, Lake Bonneville was one of the largest lakes in North America's Ice Age history. When it drained, it did catastrophically. But it carved some of the most dramatic landscape features in the Snake River system. And almost everywhere you look in northern Utah, the legacy of this great lake remains. The flat valley floors, the salt flats, and the Great Salt Lake itself. All reminders of the once great Lake Bonneville. And as always, if you like content like this, give this video a like. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.